<laughs> Spain. Amazing. The UK represent Australia. Excellent. Um, so you all probably know the drill, but um, during the talk, I'll be looking at the chat. And um, if at any point you have questions, please write them into the chat and I will pass them over to Ignacio um, a couple of times throughout the talk. And um, it's always great to have lots of questions. So do keep them, so do, do write them in the chat. Oh, we've got Germany, Madrid, Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Glendale, California. Somebody's asking for you to be president, Ignacio. <laughs> wow. Seattle. Claremont. Excellent. We've got a really diverse crowd from all over the world. Brazil, amazing. Okay, I think it's about um, five minutes past and there is 128 people in the room, which is fantastic. We got people from Spain, the UK, Mexico, Brazil, Canada, Holland. We've got a really diverse crowd from all over the globe. So uh, let's get started. Let me just repeat that um, if at any point you have questions during the talk, please write them in the chat. I'll be reading that and um, I'll pass over any questions to Ignacio. Um, when he pauses for questions. But that's it from me. So Ignacio, please take it away. Thank you, George. I'm very excited uh, to see so many people from all over the world. Uh, so I should say first, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are in this new world of Zoom. And uh, my name is uh, Ignacio Darnod, and uh, I'm really grateful to uh, Andrew Lear and George Benson from Oscar Wilde Tours to give me this opportunity uh, to give my talk uh, called Revealing the Secret Gay Codes in Iconic Works of Art. That's what I'm doing today. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of my background, um, I've been developing for a long time now a documentary series about the impact of gay artists in history called Hiding in Plain Sight, Breaking the Gay Code in Art. And in this research, which uh, is the basis of uh, the presentation today, 
Um, I've uncovered that gay artists um, have transformed uh, mainstream culture and they have revolutionized art throughout history, which is something that is not really well known or even uh, talked about. And uh, they have done that in spite of a very daunting challenge. So because homosexuality was uh, prosecuted since the fourth century, um, gay artists all their lives have had a very tough dilemma. Should they stay in the closet or should they be open with their life and their work? And in doing so, um, you know, risk uh, critical and commercial rejection or even prosecution. So this is why many um, artists, male and female, um, used secret codes in their work to express their same sex desire, which they were not allowed to do openly. But before we talk about uh, codes in art, I think it's important to remember how gay men and women have used codes in societies where they couldn't be open in their daily lives. And um, I have uh, three examples uh, for you today of that. On the left is an image of what was called the hunky code. It's something that took place or that existed um, in the States in the 70s and 80s, which uh, gave uh, a sexual meaning or a sexual code to things like earrings and handkerchiefs or keys, depending on uh, the color or where you wore it. And in doing so, that code allowed you to give a signal to other people in the community to tell them what was your uh, sexual preference. Then writers, all throughout history, um, all the way until basically the uh, liberation that came with the uh, sexual revolution of uh, Stonewall in 1969, when they were writing about their desires, in many cases, they had to use codes. For instance, um, the lesbian diarist, um, Ann Lister, uh, whose life is the basis of uh, the TV show, Gentleman Jack, which if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. Um, in her diaries, she wrote over a million words in code to describe her sexual encounters because she couldn't do it openly. And last but not least, I'm gonna talk about something that you may not be aware of, but uh, from the 19th century all the way to 1967, when homosexuality was uh, beginning to be decriminalized in England, um, gay men and women use a secret language called polari, which allowed them to speak privately in public. And in doing so, they could avoid, for instance, being caught by the many undercover policemen that were around at the time. So this is just an example of how the gay uh, community has used codes in their life. So it's no surprise that uh, gay artists have also used um, codes in their, in their work. And if you ask, why is that? Well, the key reason is that undetected by the general population, these codes allowed the gay artists to express taboos in their work in a way that would be recognized by those who knew about it without offending or alienating the general audience. So that's the, the, the main purpose of uh, the codes. And in my research, I've uh, discovered or uncovered uh, five different ways in which uh, the artists use uh, secret gay codes. So gay codes, uh, to portray homoerotic male nudes, codes to show a cruising scene, uh, metaphors as codes, codes to portray a secret love, and codes to overcome repression. So it's really extraordinary how the codes have, you know, affected so many different areas of the artist. And today I'm going to talk about all five sections with examples of each one. And like George said before. I'm gonna um, stop a couple of times in the middle in case you have questions about uh, these um, images. So let's start with 
coded homoerotic male nudes. So, you know, for an artist who wants to portray a, a male nude, codes become very handy, very helpful. And if you wonder what the word uh, homoerotic means, uh, at least my definition of it, is an image that is not overtly or openly sexual, but is very appealing to the gay community in a subtle or not so subtle way. So the first artist I want to talk about is one of the most important artists in history, um, Albrecht Dürer. And um, you may be familiar with his self-portrait here on the left, but not many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the portrait on the right, um, you know, which was very provocative for the time. He, he did it in 1505. And, uh, you know, Dürer was a very vain man. And in fact, he was um, misogynistic and openly so. And um, he lived in a country, Germany, where at the time uh, for artists to be respected socially, they needed to be married. So what that he do is he gets married in a marriage of convenience, an arranged marriage, which is very unhappy. And very soon after he, uh, he flees to Italy where he lives uh, alone. So that's kind of a little bit of a background on, on Dürer, a very fascinating um, character. And I wanna to talk to you now about one woodcut that he did in 1496 called The Bath House. So I want you to look at it for a second and see if there's anything in it that catches your eye. So this woodcut um, uh, was created by Dürer. Um, re it represents a very unusual image of a traditional bathhouse where men and women share their services, you know? And um, what is unusual about it is that it shows male nudity in public, some of which were public figures, these two men, are two brothers of one of the rule, uh, ruling families in uh, Nuremberg. And this was done uh, at a time in the Middle Ages that was completely repressive and where clothing was mandatory and it was so regimented that it ruled even the number of pearls that a woman uh, could wear on their garment. So when you look at this, you say, how did he get away with this? you know, and, and how it became such a popular uh, woodcut. Well, the reason is that this uh, woodcut is loaded with uh, coded homoerotic images that are waiting to be discovered. Um, and let, let's start the decoding of it. On the left, you see a self-portrait of Dürer, who is uh, looking very lovingly at his teacher while he's leaning next to a I would say provocative faucet. And then you see his master uh, playing, or uh, teacher playing the flute, you know, and he has a mysterious uh, male face in his body. He's wearing a very risque underwear, uh, next to which there's a profile of a male figure who is one of the two brothers I mentioned before, the pub partner, Stephen, who, according to many sources, was one of uh, Dürer's lover, lovers, and he's holding a carnation, which is the code that many gay men used um, at the time. And last but not least, behind uh, Dürer's, mass, uh, du uh, Dürer's uh, teacher's image, you see a tree, which when you look at it closely, is, is kind of looks like a, a male body upside down. So basically, the way he got away with these homoerotic images is by coding it so it wasn't that um, obvious. Now I wanna talk about something that I call it how patriotic and heroic could be a code for homoerotic. So this painting by Jacques-Louis David called a Leonidas at Thermopylae, uh, which is one of the most important paintings at the Louvre is full of homoerotic codes that art historians constantly uh, neglect to mention. 
you know. And um, David started uh, painting uh, this. It took them a long time to paint it, but he started painting it just a few years after the French Revolution legalized same-sex relations. And um, what is interesting is how David uses nudity, male nudity, uh, in this painting for different um, for different purposes. First of all, um, this is uh, you know a scene of a classical scene of Greeks and Spartans. So nudity was a fact of uh, ancient life. So you know, so that is uh, true to life. But also he used it as a political metaphor for civic virtue in France after all the excesses of the monarchy. But what is really, I find fascinating in this painting is that it has many other layers. Um, this painting also reflects the homosocial bonds that existed in France at the time in which the society was structured about the friendship between men and friendship between men and women were basically in non-existent. They were unheard of. And um, this painting also has a personal level uh, for David. I mean, we don't know if he was gay or not, um, but this painting really reflects the um, emotionally charged male bonds that existed in his studio. He was one of the most important teachers in, in France, and um, his male students were constantly trying to get David's um, approval and attention. And this painting, in a way, reflects that. So let's see how, in little details, what, what's uh, uncovered in this painting. So we see Leonidas, how his cupboard is attracting attention to his genitals instead of distracting, he's attra attracting attention. On the right, we see an image of a naked adolescent kissing a soldier. And this is what uh, David is doing is echoing the Greeks' mentorships. Uh, in, in Greek times, you know, it was completely uh, accepted. It was part of the daily uh, structure that older men instruct younger men in everything from culture to how to battle, uh, in, you know, literature, etc. So that is what he is reflecting in this uh, little detail of the painting. Here we see a young man looking, I would say, very lovingly at Leonidas, and that, in a way, represents what I mentioned before. is kind of an example of the pupils of David looking up to him in awe and reverence. Here we see an image of a young man who is offering a wreath to Hercules while he's basically checking out Leonidas' ass. And uh, so basically what, what I'm saying is that for David, heroism and homoeroticism are kind of the same thing. And the last image uh, I want to pay, uh, pay attention to is this young man who is uh, very close to Leonidas and probably the implication is that is Leonidas young lover. And what is very interesting is that this image, which is obviously erotic to us nowadays, it wasn't necessarily so at the time, because at that time in France, this idea of androgyny was the ideal of male beauty. So it really didn't necessarily have an erotic undertone that um, it would have today. Now I wanna to talk to you about one of America's most beloved paintings, The Swimming Hole by Thomas Eakins. You know, this painting is uh, universally considered like a visual poem to, uh, to male youth in an idyllic setting. But really this painting is the very first contribution to male homoeroticism in American art. So let's talk about it for a second. You know, Thomas Eakins, his sexuality is hotly debated to this day. He did hundreds of very homoerotic photographs of male nudes. Um, these are some of the students who posed for his uh, painting. This is a self-portrait of Eakins. And this is a, a portrait he did of his very handsome uh, favorite pupil, Samuel Murray, who then became his studio uh, partner. And even when Eakins got married, it was his life companion and the most important relationship of, of his life. Um, they were 
constantly together. They were constantly on camping trips. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's for many people, it's considered his life uh, long uh, relationship. And, you know, when you look at, into Eakin's letters to see if there is an answer to his sexuality, that is not clear either. He wrote to his parents a letter that said, um, a female body is the most beautiful thing in the world, except for a naked man. So let's talk about this painting. Um, this painting, it was actually a commission, uh, a commission, um, a prominent uh, man from Philadelphia commissioned it. And um, Eakins engaged several of his students to pose nude outdoors, you know, under the, let's call it excuse of classical values, the idea of fitness, of friendship, camaraderie, etc. You know, however, this painting really, really uh, broke with the convention of the time for many reasons. First, it shows uh, male nudity uh, with no narrative justification just for the uh, sake of it. And it shows people who are completely identifiable, meaning everybody in Philadelphia knew who these people were, and a recognizable local setting a pond outside of um, Philadelphia. So Eakins knew that this painting was problematic. So what does he do? Says he loads it with classical codes, trying to give the painting a patina of um, respectability. So let me walk you through those. So when you look at the painting, First of all, uh, the models, in a way, if you look at it, it looks like one male figure in different, you know, like in movement, kind of like a classical idea. And even the position of it, it looks like a Greek temple. But what is really interesting is how this, the key figure is posing like one of the most important classical statues, the David by Donatello. And this one is posing like another very important statue, the dying Gaul. So basically what Eakins is doing is using classicism as a code to cover for homoeroticism. And um, what is really fascinating about this painting is that not only this, but the truth is, is that this painting is a coded representation of a gay poem by the iconic uh, poet Walt Whitman about loving young males. So Walt Whitman, whom you can see here with his hat, um, in his uh, iconic Leaves of Grass, uh, writes about how 28 young men bathed by, the bathed by the shore, dancing and laughing along the beach, came the 29th bather, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? Eakins painted himself swimming towards the young man. He is the 29th bather. And so what I find fascinating is a, is a painting that is considered, you know, like family friendly material, you know, in America. Um, it really is a visual representation of a gay poem about loving young males. But in spite of all this coding that Eakins um, used, his rules didn't work. Um, the person who commissioned the painting rejected it, not saying why, but we know why. And from then on, um, we, um, Eakins and his students were referred to as those Whitman fellows, meaning gay. And um, in fact, this is the first of many scandals in Eakins' career that ended up with him being expelled from the academy. And Sadly, this painting that he could never sell remained in Eakins' possession until uh, he died. But what is fascinating is that Eakins is not the only artist who has done a coded tribute to the gay poet Walt Whitman. Um, David Hockney, an openly gay artist, when um, he was uh, still a student in London in 1960, creating what he called, or he defined, propaganda for homosexuality. He did this painting in 1960 called Adhesiveness, which is very important in his career because it's really his first double portrait. 
And um, this is a tribute to his hero, Walt Whitman. And the tribute is in the title, Adhesiveness, which is the word that um, Walt Whitman invented to describe the friendship and intimacy between men. He also, as you can see, he depicts Walt Whitman's iconic uh, hat. But what is really interesting is that Hockney uses in his painting um, the same codes that Whitman used in his diaries when he describing when he was describing his sexual encounters. So instead of writing the names of the people, instead of letters, Whitman and then Hockney uses their corresponding number in the alphabet. So you see four and eight, the fourth letter and the eighth letter, D, H, and 2323, 23, WW, Walt Whitman. So that's what Whitman did in his diaries. And that is what um, um, Hockney is doing in a very playful tribute to um, Walt Whitman. Again, is how codes are used to many different effects. I want to show you how throughout history, arts, artists, uh, you know, from even uh, before Christ until present day, have used the code of uh, homoerotic wrestling images to express same-sex desire. You know, there are thousands of images. I mean, you could do a whole talk just on that. These are just some random ones from the third AD to all the way to the 1980s. This one is by Eakins. And um, the reason I wanna bring you uh, this to your attention is because I wanna talk about how a very important artist, a modern artist, Francis Bacon, used this code uh, of wrestlers in one of his paintings. So Bacon, Francis Bacon, who I assume many of you will know, uh, painted these two figures in 1953, and it's a crucial painting in his career. And he created this at a time in which homosexuality was punishable in England with up to two years in prison. Um, so this painting captures the violent intimacy that exists between Francis Bacon and his then partner, Peter Lacey, they have a very, you know, sadomasochistic uh, relationship. And the painting is very daring. I mean, you can see an erection. And uh, we, as a viewer, we feel like we are witnesses or maybe even intruders into this uh, uh, private space. So much so that um, when this painting was first displayed at a gallery, it had to be hung upstairs hiding kind of in a closet in case there was a police raid. And, um, you know, if Bacon had admitted that this painting was a reflection of his sexual desires, uh, taking, you know, wrestlers from the uh, mat to the bed, you know, like savage lovers, it would have been considered pornographic and he would have been sent to prison. So when he is asked about the meaning of this painting, he avoids any sexual references. And he talks about how, you know, they are wrestlers. This is a metaphor of post-war violence and how it was influenced by artists like Michelangelo or by the photographs of wrestlers like this one uh, from Edward uh, Mybridge. So basically what he's doing is you know, trying to give his painting a palatable face. And what is fascinating is that um, this avoidance, uh, Bacon extended it to his private life. Uh, during his lifetime, he resisted all biographies and he didn't come out publicly as a gay man until he was in his seventies. And when he did so, um, he said that he preferred to be called queer instead of gay. And um, what is fascinating too to me is that the critics accepted this cover up and they named him the most important artist um, of his generation. 
The only critic that didn't accept that was the Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, who when speaking about Bacon, referred to him as that dreadful man who paints those horrible pictures. Something that Margaret Thatcher, I'm sorry, something that uh, Bacon was uh, very proud of. So now I'm gonna show you how artists uh, use codes to show a scene, a cruising scene. So look for a second at this stunning painting from the year 1600. This painting by Domenico Cresti is called Bathers at San Nicolo. And um, the, the painting shows the, uh, the Arno River section of Florence, which at the time was one of the most uh, preeminent um, gay cruising um, areas. So what's really extraordinary is that Cresti, that, to show male nudity, Cresti doesn't uh, uh, use the excuse that all his contemporary artists used at the time, which is show religious images like St. Sebastian or mythological images that allow them to, to show nudity. No, no, no. Cresti shows a slice of daily life um, with an idealized version of friendship and maybe love between two men who, as you can see, they are engaged in a very ardent gaze and their hands are touching. And then, uh, he's pointing at a building, which at the time was a bathhouse, maybe indicating that um, that's where um, they would go later. You know, when this, this painting was sold in auction um, three years ago for three quarter million dollars, and the catalog described it as the most important example of homoerotic art of the period, anticipating by 300 years, the uh, painting, uh, the swimming hall of Thomas Eakins, which we just talked about a minute ago. So you wonder, how did he, again, I always ask that question, how did he get away with this in the year 1600? Well, one of the theories is that he used uh, the excuse of classical codes. So here is a very famous drawing by Michelangelo called the Battle of Cascina. And it's an image that has been used by artists from then on all the way to present time to, uh, as a reference to show homoerotic male nudes. So if you look at it up close, you'll see how these two figures resemble very much the central figure in Cressy's painting. And his back looks very much like the famous Belvedere torso, which is one of the most famous classical uh, statues. So what Cresti is saying is, don't come to me saying that this is homoerotic. This is classical images. And if it was good for Michelangelo, it's good enough for me. So this idea of a classical code to cover up for homoeroticism. I wanna to talk to you now about an artist who unfortunately doesn't have the reputation that he deserves is Paul Cadmus. And the reason he doesn't have that reputation is because he always was out with his work and he painted images that were either gay or homoerotic. And because of that, he was dismissed by critics. This painting that he did in 1951 is a very important painting because it's the first Western painting to portray a same-sex couple in an intimate setting. But I'm showing this just to give you a preamble on who Paul Cadmus was, because remember, we are in the cruising scenes. So two decades before the bath, uh, Cadmus um, painted the fleets in a coded painting that caused a national scandal. So he used satire to code a scene in which men and women are fighting to get um, sailors' um, attention. So this painting, which was commissioned by the government, when it was first displayed in Washington, there was a public outcry. A high rank Navy officer said that this was a most disreputable, a sordid scene without specifying why. And a cousin of the then uh, President Roosevelt, um, also a high rank Navy officer, 
came into the Corcoran Museum and came out with the painting under his arm. Nobody opposed him. And uh, they were trying to stop the press from getting a hold of it so the image wouldn't be widespread. But it was too late. Next day, uh, the papers all over the country uh, talked about the, the, the image and it became front, front page scandal everywhere to the point that Paul Cadmus uh, received uh, death threats and he had to uh, hide with his family until um, the scandal subsided. But what is really, really striking is that none of the articles explain what's so scandalous about the painting. So what is all the fuss about? Well, let's look at this particular detail of the painting. In this uh, detail, you see a blonde man, you know, very well-groomed, um, offering a cigarette to a sailor who, you know, eagerly accepts it in what is basically a gay pickup scene. And uh, the, the man is wearing a red tie, which was the code used at the time um, for gay men to recognize each other. So <clears throat> what is fantastic to me is that, you know, that is the only thing that is scandalous in the painting because the fact that sailors are drunk or they're picking up women is considered, you know, the, day li the daily lives of sailors. So the fact that the homosexuality is unspeakable is what uh, allowed Paul Cadmus to really mock the Navy in this uh, painting. And as a, you know, as a side effect of it, he, Cadmus, became a star in the art world because of this scandal. And this painting was withdrawn from circulation and nobody saw it again until um, 1982. So it's time if anybody has, George, if anybody has a question before we move on. Uh, yeah, we had a, just a couple of questions. Um, Thomas asked that you said that the French Revolution legalized same-sex relations. Does that mean that homosexuality was decriminalized or that gay marriage was legal? No, that homosexuality was decriminalized in 1791. And then um, later on, when the Napoleonic Code was written, uh, and the main, one of the main people uh, who got into it was gay, then it, they took it over and the Napoleonic Code also um, legalized same-sex relations, but they were not the first to do so. The French Revolution did that in 1791. Of course, not gay marriage, just uh, legalized uh, same-sex relations. Cool. And um, what is the name of um, Domenico's painting? Bathers at San Nicolo. Bathers at Excellent. San Nicolo. Great. Um, we have a question from Jordi who's as asking, what are cruising scenes? Cruising scene, uh, cruising, uh, for those of you uh, heterosexual in the audience, um, cruising <laughs> is basically this idea of, uh, I guess, men, mostly men, you know, when they go, for instance, in parks or in public spaces, looking for trying to have a sexual encounter. That's what is called cruising. And, and that is what um, those images uh, reflect, what those artists uh, reflected in their work. Excellent. And do you know who discovered or revealed um, Cadmus's painting in 1982? Who? I'm sorry, who discovered it? Yeah. No, who it was just, it? Uh, for, it was the first time that it came back into an exhibition in a museum in 1982. I got it. Um, in the Ray's asking, in the Fleet's Inn, was it ever considered that some of the women meant to look like men in drag? Yes, absolutely. And, and not only that, but there are other paintings, not, not uh, this one, um, by Cadmus that he does that in an even more overtly way. Yes. It was a very dirty Amazing. painting. Mm, absolutely. Okay, that's all the questions we have okay. for now. So moving on.
to how artists use metaphors as codes in their work. And I'm gonna talk about two artists that everybody knows, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. Um, what they had in common is that neither one had sexual relationship with women. Um, however, they uh, showed uh, their sexuality or they expressed it in their work in very different ways. Um, what they had in common is that they both used um, allegories in their work to express uh, their same sex desires. So let's talk about Leonardo. You know, in today's terms, Leonardo da Vinci would be described as an openly gay man. Um, in his diaries, he wrote cheeky things such as, oh, last Saturday I went to the baths to see naked men, you know? And uh, in fact, he was accused publicly of sodomy twice. And he wasn't sentenced because in both instances, um, he was uh, with a friend who had um, deep connections with the powerful Medici family. And um, in his sketchbooks, Leonardo has many loving studies of his um, um, oh, assistant uh, that he nicknamed Salai, or which means little devil. And uh, he called him little devil because uh, Leonardo, Leonardo constantly complains in his diaries about how Salai is a thief and a liar. But the fact is that he remained with him the rest of his life. And um, it's really poignant to see this drawing that Leonardo has in one of his sketchbooks um, in which he shows himself back to back with Salai, you know, sharing the back. Um, and it's called allegory of pain and pleasure, in which the message is that for Leonardo with Salai, um, you know, pain and pleasure are inseparable. And, you know, showing that that, is, uh, that was the real true nature of that relationship. And uh, when uh, Leonardo died, he bequeathed uh, three of his most important paintings to Salai, including the Mona Lisa. And according to many experts, it was Salai who posed for the Mona Lisa. Then in a different corner is Michelangelo. Michelangelo um, really um, struggled with a lifelong conflict between his homosexuality and his deep sense of religion. Um, he painted many religious images and he accepted the commission of the Sistine Chapel because he thought that that would save um, his soul. But the fact is that he can avoid, uh, he cannot avoid showing his true desires in his work. These are just some random images from um, the Sistine Chapel in which you see, for instance, just in one corner, three male couples engaged in embraces and kissing. And these are some of the, they're called the nudie, um, which are very homoerotic and uh, are considered the first gay pinups in, um, in history. And now I wanna to talk to you about of, uh, uh, maybe um, Michelangelo's most important relationship of his life, um, which is Tommaso de Cavalieri. So Michelangelo uh, met the nobleman uh, Tommaso when Michelangelo was around 58 and Tommaso was 17 or 18. And uh, Tommaso was described by everybody as a man of immense beauty and intelligence. And Michelangelo fell in love immediately with uh, Tommaso. They started a relationship. Um, we don't know the exact nature of the relationship um, because by all accounts, Tommaso was heterosexual. He was married, he had uh, two children. Um, but the fact that in his autobiography, Michelangelo constantly referred to uh, his chastity um, kind of reveals what were his true desires for, um, for Tommaso. And that's where this culture comes to play. Uh, Michelangelo did this uh, sculpture in 1534 just uh, uh, soon after uh, he started his relationship with Tommaso. And in this, in a coded way, 
he, this is a self-portrait of Michelangelo, and this is what may be the only uh, likeness we have of Tommaso de Cavalieri, and we see how Michelangelo is trampled by his unfulfilled relationship with Tommaso de Cavalieri. But in spite of this, uh, they remain together the rest of their life, and Michelangelo died 30 years later um, with Tommaso holding his hand. And I'm gonna keep talking about uh, Michelangelo, but before I do that, I wanna uh, kind of walk you into something that is fascinating, is uh, how artists use Greek mythology, in particular Zeus's love for Ganymede, to express the desire between older and younger men in a coded way. So here we see a statue by Cellini, a one by Gabriel Ferrier, or this one by Rubens. So in Greek mythology, Zeus, you know, the god, uh, fell in love with the beautiful young Ganymede. Um, and so Zeus turned himself into an eagle and came to earth and abducted a Ganymede and took him to Mount Olympus where they lived happily ever after. So, you know, the Greeks justify this myth by saying, oh, what it is, is really a metaphor of the ascent of the soul rejoicing in God or you know, platonic love with any physical bonds. But the truth is that myth, uh, this myth um, of Ganymede was created to justify the desire between um, older men and younger men. And just pay attention to this one, which I was blown away when I uh, saw it at the gay tour of the Prado Museum in Madrid. Um, by Rubens, who by all accounts is uh, heterosexual, but look at how graphic and sexually provocative is this image of Ganymede. Uh, so let's um, see how Michelangelo used Ganymede for his own purposes. So some of the most extraordinary drawings in Michelangelo's career are the ones he sent to Tommaso de Cavalieri. Um, in this one, in, uh, it's called uh, The Rape of Ganymede. So Michelangelo, using Ganymede, he's trying to imply that his relationship with Tommaso evokes the classical, uh, you know, platonic mentorship between uh, old men and younger men. But the reality is that Ganymede gave him a code to conceal what would be Otherwise, an explicit expression of desire, which would have, you know, sent him to prison because sodomy uh, was uh, punishable at that time. So that's why he uses uh, Ganymede. But what is really fascinating is that, unlike the previous images of Ganymede, that usually he's a victim, very kind of androgynous. No, 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 no. Michelangelo does a strong young man who is a willing participant in the abduction. And even the pose kind of give a little bit of a sense of an erotic implication in this, um, in this image. But not only drawings, um, Michelangelo sent Tommaso dozens of poems, very sexually um, explicit, in what, is the, in what is considered the very first uh, body of verses in modern language written by one man addressed to another. And uh, he told Tommaso things like, I'm a slave, prisoner of love. My wicked senses have uh, deprived my heart of peace. If to be happy, I must be conquered and chained. It is no wonder that naked and alone, I remain prisoner of an armed cavalier. Um, which is very cute, the way he does a pun of words between cavalier and cavalieri. But what is I find really sad is that when uh, Michelangelo's grandnephew published them these sonnets for the very first time in 1623, he changed the pronouns as if the poems were addressed to a female lover, and this is a pattern that has in my research that I found that occurs in history where the family of artists uh, destroy 
all the evidence of uh, an artist's homosexuality, something that is really sad. And this cover-up was not discovered until 300 years later. You know, up until then, everybody thought that they were addressed to, um, to a woman. Now, staying with the idea of metaphors, I want to talk about uh, female or lesbian artists. And, you know, prior to modern times, there were very few openly out lesbian artists. These are some of them, like Romaine Brooks, Tamara, Jean Mammon, Leonard Feeney, Black. They all had one thing in common. They were rich. They were affluent. And because of that, they could uh, get away with being um, open uh, with their work. But not everybody did. And uh, many of them used codes, metaphorical codes in their work. For instance, Ethel Sands in 1910, you know, he wanted to, she, I'm sorry, she wanted to paint her partner. She couldn't do that openly. So what does she do? She paints the couch where she spends all the intimate time with her partner, like a tribute to her. And then Tamara de Lempica um, in this painting called Double 47 is a code um, of the street number where her favorite lesbian bar was located. And here we see Gluck. Um, from 32 to 36, Gluck, uh, her partner was a florist. So she couldn't paint her openly. So what does she do? She paints her lover's favorite flowers. And when her partner, when they break up, Gluck starts painting dried flowers. Um, and then one year later, uh, when Gluck meets a new partner, Nesta, and for whatever reason, um, she's no longer afraid uh, to be open about it. She paints this double portrait called Medallion, which is now considered an icon in uh, gay art. Then Rosa Bonheur, a French artist who is famous for uh, painting animals, particularly bulls, um, she loved to uh, uh, be dressed in, in man's clothes, which was illegal at the time in France. So she needed to get a transvestite permit from the government to wear them. And, and she said that the only males she liked were the bulls that she painted. And what I find really, really amazing is um, when she painted her self-portrait, she did it in this image called El Cid, which is now the Prado Museum. And she portrayed herself as a male lion, free, rebellious, brave. And in a way, she, the lion even looks like her. Uh, I, I was literally awestruck when I saw it at the, uh, at the Prado Museum. Now we're moving into a completely different area, but you'll see why it's uh, metaphor related. The AIDS era obviously had a impact on creativity and on artists. Uh, some of them were political, like David Bonner Robbish. Uh, some were activists like Keith Haring, some of them were more represent, uh, representational, like Hugh Steers. And today, I want to talk to you about um, an artist who used metaphors in his work. And the, the name of this artist um, is Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, he's a Cuban artist who moved to the US in uh, 1979. And both him and his partner died of AIDS. And um, his philosophy as an artist was um, not to be angry or confrontational. So unlike artists like uh, Keith Haring, for instance, um, he believed that the most uh, successful political moves of all, of, um, of all are the ones that do not appear to be political. And he said that his goal was to infiltrate museums just like the AIDS virus infiltrated him. So how did he do that? Well, he did that um, using emotional metaphors and codes that invited the viewer into, to participate in the creative experience, calling attention to the spiritual impact of AIDS. And 
I get emotional just talking about this particular uh, piece. Um, this is a really moving example of his work that he did in 1991, uh, the year that his partner died. And it's called Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA. So this installation is basically, you know, uh, candy in the exact weight of his partner, 175 pounds. So the viewer is encouraged to eat the candy, you know? And in doing so, you know, the installation starts diminishing until it disappears, just like his partner did. So when I first confronted this um, installation, I, you know, I ate the candy like everybody else. And, and then I read the card explaining what it meant. And it talked about how by you eating the candy, you are part of society and the silent participation in the death of gay men and women during the AIDS era. And also how once the uh, installation is depleted, it gets filled up again. So in a way, Felix Gonzalez Torres was giving his partner eternal life. So I was so moved by realizing what he was uh, talking about in his work that I literally had to sit down because I, I broke down in tears. And um, to this day, I get emotional. And it shows you the transformative uh, power of art. And, um, you know, with work like this that um, wasn't openly gay, um, he became a really important artist. In fact, one of the most influential artists of the 1990s. So I encourage you to, to, to uh, read more about um, uh, Felix's uh, work. Questions? George? Hi, yeah. Um, Kapoor, I'll start with the most recent one first. Isn't there also a Catholic transubstantiation ethic in that transubstantiation? That could be another layer of, of the meaning of that too. You're right. The communion, this idea of communion, you're totally right. That's a great, uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Excellent. Um, Glenn asks about the transvestite permit. Um, when was this and who else would have a reason to be granted one? Um, as far as I know, um, I don't know if anybody else did, but I know it was a big deal for her. I mean, she, she was living openly with two women at the time. She's buried with both of them. And uh, she was a very renowned painter. Um, and she's the one who, who got it. I'm not sure if other people did, but my guess is not many. Um, Christopher's asked, given the enormity of the topic, how did you approach your research? Wow. That's a big question. Maybe one for uh, the end. I'll leave it for the end, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, David's asked, wasn't Michelangelo's battle of Cascino destroyed? It was, it was, Cushina. it was. And I, I didn't want to get into it, but yes, it was. And there is a lot of uh, discussion on how it got destroyed. Uh, one of them, it was uh, another artist who was very jealous of it, uh, broke it. So the image that you saw today is a copy of it. We don't have, uh, the original doesn't exist anymore. But in any case, this copy, uh, it has been extremely influential, but yes, the original was destroyed. Mm. Great, I think that's it for now. Okay. So now let's to, uh, get into another uh, session, which is also to me very moving is the coded description of a secret love. And I'm gonna start talking about an artist that again, I feel that he doesn't have the reputation that he deserves, is Marcin Hartley. Um, he was gay and he lived in the United States and he found it very repressive. So right before World War I, he moves to Germany, to Berlin, which was the liberal capital of the world. And immediately he falls in love with the, German, the country, the, the soldiers paraphernalia, and in fact, he starts showing his sexual infatuation with soldiers in this early painting called uh, The Warriors from 1913. But then, soon after, he meets this Prussian soldier called Karl von Freiburg, and this relationship transforms 
his life and his art. Um, I love how uh, uh, Marston describes um, Carl as six feet of splendor and lusty manhood made of youthful and simple desire. No one is more beloved and necessary to the well-being of the world. Our spiritual marriage is worthy of worship. I love that, that definition. Um, but guess what? Carl goes to war and he dies soon after. So Mars and Harley needs to express his grief. But he cannot do it openly because A, it's a homosexual relationship, and B, it's a German soldier, the enemy. So what does he do? He gets into a frenzy. And in less than a month, he creates 12 life-size abstract paintings expressing his love for Carl in a coded way. And these paintings, which I'm going to decode for you in a second, they've revolutionized abstract art. So look at it for a second, just to get um, familiar with it. So in this painting called painting for um, 47, Marcin Harley is identifying all of his lover's attributes as a soldier, mid body up, except his likeness. So he's using symbols. And the final image is kind of an anthropomorphic image, kind of like a coffin in which the body is covered by flags and symbols of Carl that allow Mars and Harley to grieve. And let's talk about specifically what's in this painting. So the black background, obviously, is a symbol of mourning. Here, he paints a halo around his helmet because Harley considers um, Carl a saint. This is a symbol of Carl's regiment, the Queen Elizabeth. This is Carl's horse spur, his initials, the iron cross that Carl uh, received and is positioned in the painting where his heart would be. Chess, because they love to play chess together, and 24, the age of Carl when he died. So when you see this painting in person, which I've seen several times, you know, it, it's a beautiful painting. But then when you read what it really means, it's so moving that it's just, um, I find it extraordinary. But what is fascinating is that I hardly was never open about his sexuality when he was alive. And he told very few people that Carl's death was the inspiration for this painting. Um, so when uh, Marsden exhibited these paintings in America, New York, two years later, he was accused of being a pro-German traitor. And what is uh, interesting is that Martin Harley's homosexuality was not addressed in any exhibition until his retrospective at the Whitney in 1980. And to me, it's important to, to mention that fact because as you can see, his homosexuality is key to his work. It's not an anecdote. I get passionate about this. Um, so now I, it's one of my favorite topics. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with uh, American Gothic, which is one of America's uh, most iconic painting. And it was created by Grant Wood. So Grant Wood's homosexuality was an open secret in his hometown in Iowa. Um, you know, he had this facade of the farmer. He was always wearing overalls and saying things in interviews like, oh, all my great ideas came to me when I was milking a cow, when the reality is that he hadn't been in a farm since he was 10 years old. Um, Grant Wood was forced to stay in the closet by the art group that he belonged to, the regionalists, because the leader of the group, Thomas Benton, a fantastic artist, despised gay artists. But also 
because his sister, Nan, who uh, he was uh, very close to, was wildly homophobic. So this tension is at the core of this painting that made him a star when it debuted in 1930. And in the painting, we see Granwood's sister, Nan, who posed for it. And this is Granwood's alter ego, his Dennis. And we see how she is kind of watching him like a hawk, you know, which is what happened in uh, real life. And at the time, he became, like I say, a celebrity, Grant Wood, and there were dozens of articles about him. And the articles alluded to his sexuality in not so subtle ways. They talked about how he was a shy bachelor who lived with his mother, who had a high pitched voice, who had no intention of getting married. And this was very troubling to run wood. And this brings me to the painting that I want to talk about today, a painting that Grant Wood created the same year of American Gothic. And it's a painting that shares very much the same conflicted tone of American Gothic. And this painting, um, uh, uh, Grant Wood reveals his desire for his assistant, Arnold Pyle, who shared, who lived and worked with uh, Grant Wood in very um, small quarters. And, you know, Arnold, who is 21 at the time of the portrait, as you can see, he is slender, good looking, strong, dark hair, exactly the type of man that Grant Wood fell in love with time and time again throughout his life. So on surface, this painting, is another one of Grant Wood's images of rural America. But this painting has much more to it than that. First of all, you can see how there's a sense of nostalgia in it. It's kind of nostalgic, this painting. And there is a theme of couples in the painting. There are two haystacks, two bushes, two trees, two naked men alluding to uh, Grant Wood's longing for Arnold Pyle. But let's look at it more closely. See, in the lower right corner, you see two uh, young men, skinny dipping. And this image really evokes the traditional representations of Adam and Eve being expelled from Eden. This idea of the loss of innocence. This idea of being, you know, punished for a sin, in this case, indulging in homosexuality. And if you look at the position of uh, this young man, it's a very clearly sexual um, image. But there's more in this painting. You see here a butterfly um, landing on Arnold's sleeve. So that code, you know, there is a traditional interpretation, butterfly is a metaphor for youth turning into maturity, but there's much more to it. Um, Grant Wood and Arnold Pyle spend all their time together in uh, free time in a place called the Butterfly Tea Shop. Also, uh, Grant Wood had just uh, returned from France where the word papillon, butterfly, was beginning to be used as a code for homosexuals. And last but not least, if you think about it, a butterfly has the power to camouflage its beauty from predators, which is exactly what Grant Wood was doing at the time when all those articles were coming out. And um, what is really sad is that Grant Wood was forced to stay in the closet by his sister, um, Nan, who is here, uh, lived until 1990, 60 years after she posed uh, for American Gothic, milking the fact that she posed for it. And she spent the rest of her life uh, spreading lies and myths about the supposed female lovers of Grant Woods, suing anyone who uh, was trying to uh, say that he was a homosexual. And she burned all his letters because she said they were unimportant. 
Again, another example of a family member destroying proof of an artist's um, homosexuality. And um, this is part, partly, I believe, the reason why Grant Wood's homosexuality was not discussed in public until the retrospective that took place two years ago at the Whitney in 2018. And the catalog um, said how homosexuality is the code that unlocks the truth to Grant Wood's art. This is how important it was for him. Then the last chapter I want to talk about is codes uh, used to overcome repression. So it's widely known that uh, the McCarthy era, you know, targeted communists, but it's not so well known that they also targeted in a bigger number, but in a quieter capacity, homosexuals. In fact, in 1953, the President Roosevelt uh, barred any gay men or women to work in the government. And if you admitted to be homosexual at the time, you would have been sent to prison 15 years to life. So obviously, gay artists couldn't show any same-sex images in art. In fact, figurative art basically disappeared altogether. And this is when abstract expressionism erupted, transforming art history. This painting um, from 1950 by George Tucker called The Subway is a really important painting. And in it, he depicts in a coded way, the fear, the anxiety, and the shame of gay men and women during the McCarthy era, in which was a modern day purgatory. And in a way, it was a preamble of what we would call later the closet. And then I want to talk about uh, Jasper Jones, who turned 90 this year. And um, in all his interviews, he said he didn't want um, his work to um, expose his feelings. In fact, his relationship with Robert Rosenberg of eight years, which is the most important relationship of his life, was kept secret. And these are some of his paintings. I'm sure you, you're very familiar with his flags. So, I want to uh, talk about, to end my talk, um, of two pieces um, that he created, one at the beginning and one at the end of his relationship with Rosenberg. Um, the first one is called Target with Plaster Casts, and the second one called Painting uh, with Two uh, Balls. And in both uh, pieces, he reflects the repression of the McCarthy era in a coded way. So let, let me walk you through that. So in Target with Plaster Casts, he created nine different cubicles with nine different body parts, including the penis, uh, the nipple, etc. And these are the, a metaphor for the desires that a gay man could be in prison at the time. And each of them has a little door that could be closed for each body part in what would become a closet. So basically, Jasper Jones is using in his work the same tactics used by gay men at the time to escape the tension. The idea of the closet, masks, dissimulation, you know? And even here, he portrays himself as a modern day, modern day Saint Sebastian targeted by the repressive McCarthy era. And what is fascinating is the Museum of Modern Art in New York wanted to uh, buy this piece, but they wanted to display it with the cubicle of the penis closed. And Jasper Jones rejected it. And so that's why they didn't buy it. And then in 1960, he created this painting called Painting with Two Balls which shows how his sexuality, or is a code or a metaphor, his sexuality is uh, repressed by the macho posturing of abstract expressionism with artists like Jackson Pollock. 
And, and if you see this painting in person, which I've seen many times, you really can feel how his sexuality is being squashed by abstract um, expressionism. So Jasper Jones in his work, what he's doing, he's articulating the desire of a closeted man and subverting, turning upside down abstract expressionism. And in doing so, he becomes a bridge between abstract expressionism and pop art. And that's why he's such a uh, important um, artist. So that's basically it. And I wanna end uh, by saying that the reason for me, for my documentary and for this talk today is to me, it's very important that these gay codes don't get forgotten. Um, I want them to remain present and they don't get erased from history and from our collective memory. And the last thing I wanna say is um, something that um, an artist called Enrique Martinez Salaya said, which I think symbolizes the whole talk, is art is as much about what is not there as about what is there. The greatness of a work of art depends more in what it holds back than in what it shows. So that's it for me. I hope you're not um, exhausted. <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions, I think, uh, George, I think you may have more questions. Yes, um, a couple of questions. Lots of people actually saying now, thank you. This was phenomenal, brilliant. I learned a lot. Um, so there's lots of love coming in, but um, questions. Um, Robert has asked, I'd be curious to hear if you have ex specific examples of gay codes in American Gothic, if there are any. Well, it's fine that you ask that. I didn't wanna uh, mention it because, um, you know, that is open to interpretation, but there are experts who talk about, first of all, this is a satire of, you know, traditional rural life in America. And it's done in a very, it's done in a very campy way, you know? So that kind of gay campy. Uh, and then others allude to possible codes in how um, Grant Wood extended the head of his sister Nan, in which kind of becomes, looks like a phallus or a, or a penis. And even the window, is kind of a, a phallic image, you know what I'm saying? So, but again, I didn't mention that before because that's open to interpretation, but answering your question, that's, um, that's the answer. Mm, interesting. Um, let's see. Um, this question here, I think is about Jasper John saying that he took some risks though. Some of his symbols look pretty near the edge. Do you think he was being um, provocative, even though it was coded? You know, is, is this kind of thing, uh, like Marcel Harley, you know, you need to express yourself. And but the society is not allowing you. So you're going to go as far as you can with it. And that is the definition of the code, you know. So in the case of um, the painting with two balls, you know, he could always argue, oh, no, 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 that's just, you know, a, a piece. But for those in the know, it's an open, uh, you know, accusation of the repression of the McCarthy era. So he kind of plays it on both sides. And that is the, the benefit of using codes. Mm. There was that question we didn't touch on earlier, the um, how did you go about researching? this? Well, you know, it all started when many years ago, I, I'm a big art freak. And I realized that many of the artists uh, whom I love uh, happened to be gay, even though I didn't know at the time. So why was I responding so intimately to artists um, without knowing that they were gay? And that's when I started my research. And that's when I realized how they expressed their sexuality 
in a coded way or in not so subtle ways. And that to me opened up Andorra's box of a story that needs to be told. Um, and you know, that's what the documentary is gonna cover in the different ways. And this is just uh, a really minute uh, example of what the, hopefully the docuseries will cover. Amazing. When's that out? Well, thank you everybody. Um, it was really a pleasure. And uh, I love when somebody says I learned from it because part of my goal is to open people's eyes to this uh, topic. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, whilst people are here, let me just tell um, people about the um, uh, tours that we're coming, we 